presentation is going to be intermingled with some of Dolly's own quotes from books that he wrote or interviews. And of course, one of my favorite quotes from Salvador Dali, drawing is the touchstone of art. You will see throughout this lecture that uh, Dali was a highly, highly prolific draftsman. I find his drawings um, even more fascinating than his paintings, his oils on canvas and panels. So some key points about the exhibits. So when were these works last shown? It's been almost three decades since the majority of these works on paper have been shown at the museum. This has to do with works on paper can tend to be very fragile and some of them are 100 years old. Um, so this really will be an opportunity for you to see these works on paper, these drawings, because they're going to go back into the vault for a, a minimum five years, and it could be much longer than that. Now, I'm going to use the term drawing just how we did in the exhibit. Most people think of drawing as um, pencil or ink on paper. I'm going to use it to describe watercolor gouache, which is an opaque watercolor. It's a thicker um, type of watercolor. So I'm just going to use the term drawing. But it's really a work on paper, all different types of paper. So this. These drawings are Dolly's opportunity to think out loud. It's kind of like a writer. Um, some writers, they just write down a bunch of notes and that's how they begin the writing process. Well, Dolly was the same way with his paintings. He would begin by thinking out loud through his drawing. And you'll see in some of the examples where the drawings change and then you get to the final painting where he has finally figured out what he really wants to do with the work. And like our um, education curator says, Dolly has the permission to try and even fail without penalty. So here's a wonderful picture of Dolly. This is not in our collection. The painting he's working on is Galatia of the Spheres, but as you can see up here, drawings, drawings, some drawings and um, a triangle, books. This is how Dolly would work. And in some photographs, I don't think I have them in the lecture, but he would have photographs on the wall. And so he would be working from all of these to then complete the painting. So the intent of Dolly's drawings in our collection, they could be doodles, initial ideas, concepts, experiments with media, meaning the different types of whether it be ink, gouache, even mixed a little oil, um, transformations of other artists' works, book illustrations and commercial products, projects, preparations for a future painting, or highly developed and careful drawings that were meant to be exhibited as a drawing. So all different ideas you will see in this exhibit. There are about 100 works on display in our galleries right now of these drawings. And again, they'll be put back in the vault soon. Another aspect of this exhibit, and this is where I played the key role as I'm the registrar and collection manager, so I take care of the works and I document and I choose when they're conserved. The majority of these drawings had never been conserved. So as you can see, this was before conservation. This is after conservation. So in this exhibit, I believe 60 of the works were conserved, so we are able to exhibit them. And from this point on, I will track all humidity levels, all light levels, 
for future generations so people who come after me will know how much time those pieces have spent in light and in humidity. And that's how museums determine when they will bring out their drawings and for how long. <clears throat> so we're going to begin with Dali's early period. And for those of you who don't know, Dali was born in 1904 in Figueres, Spain. Oops. Ooh. And a quote, remember only that the whole lofty morality of your work depends on knowing how to draw well. And this is from his 50 Secrets of Magic Craftsmanship. And this is where Dali, it was written in 1948, I believe. And this is where um, he really talks about his process of drawing and painting, even the types of materials that he uses. And Dali knew that um, the great masters that came before him, if you can't draw well, then you probably will not be able to paint well. And in our archives, we have um, copies of his old report cards in art school. And every semester, it was A's in drawing. Even his teachers realized that Dali really had uh, the capacity and the knowledge to really draw well. This is an early, early work, circa 1916. So he is about 12 years old. 12 years old, and he's drawing pictures of witches. Some of them are in like a circular formation, and you'll see later. This has to do with his culture, the Sardana. It's a dance in the Catalonian region of Spain. But these were works that he began at 12 to illustrate a book. Now, moving on, he's about 13 now. And on the left, he's working in charcoal. You can already see he knows about perspectives, shadows, Look at the rippling effect that he's created with the charcoal, the shadows with the clouds. This is a 13-year-old boy who is already coming into being a true artist. This piece was actually exhibited as one of his first pieces that was exhibited professionally. And then over to the right, it's 1923, it's a little later, and if any of you know a little bit about art history, we're moving into Cubism and Picasso. So by this time, Picasso had already been very prolific, but Dali was well aware of Picasso. He set out to be better than Picasso. Um, so he begins working and playing with cubism at an early age. This is pencil on paper. This is beautiful, and it looks so lovely now that it's been conserved. Before, it was brown, yellow. You could barely see the graphite, and now it's just gorgeous. So about 100 years old. Now here's some more charcoal work that he did on the left. This was actually used for an exhibition poster. We didn't realize this until we started digging into our own archives and reading some information from our benefactors, the Morrises. And he mentions when he purchased this and then later showed Dali because they were friends, Dali said, oh yeah, I did that for an exhibition poster. And we had no idea until we had gotten into the archives and started really discovering new things about these drawings. And then over on the right here, 1920, both 1920, he's 16. I'm still in awe of this. That's why if you have children or grandchildren that are beginning to develop these skills, really guide them because look what can become of their gift. And Dolly truly had a gift. Over here, um, it's a watercolor. It's very big on screen. It's about four inches 
by four inches. It's very, very small, which that's one of another things that I love about this exhibit. Some of these drawings are extremely small, but you can get really close up to them and see the detail and see the masterwork. So then we're going to move on to portraits. Here's a portrait on the left. Um, in my last lecture, I believe I may have mentioned this man. He was a famous composer and musician at the time. Um, he created a lot of compositions for the dance of the Sardana. And this is Manuel de Falla. So Picasso also knew of this composer. So Dali, 26, 1926. He's about 22 at the time. He's at a specific um, art school in Madrid. So now he's around a lot of different students from all over Spain who are being heavily influenced by the older artists. And you can see that in his work. Now the one on the right, don't like to use the word strange, but I will. Um, the hands, everything's so precise in this drawing, and we still don't know what this drawing was intended for. Um, knowing what I know about Dali, there had to have been a purpose to this one, because there wasn't a painting that came afterwards that had the same type of portrait in it. So I'm wondering maybe this was one of his um, explorations and book illustrations, which he did around this time, but we just don't know yet. And maybe that information will come out later. We're constantly learning new things. Um, the one on, they're both pencil on paper. Uh, different papers, which also tells us as a museum that at this point in time he had access to different materials. The paper on the right is a very thick, almost like arch paper, if any of you are familiar with lithography, but it's a very heavy paper. So he's having ac um, access to these expensive types of paper. The one on the left is a much thinner paper, which has more conservation issues. But our conservator who conserved all these, she was blown away by the time she had worked on all the pieces because she was amazed at all the different papers or pieces of cardboard that Dolly used. He would pick something up, it was whatever he had available to him, and he would draw on them. So here on the left, this is, um, for those of you, I'm sure you remember that old onion skin of the typewriter. That's the type of paper that this one on the left, it's very, very fragile. It was conserved. But we can see Picasso's influence um, so clearly here. There's many um, paintings by Picasso that have these nude, figures bathing, just like this one. Um, this is him exploring, this is Dali exploring these ideas, and later on, by 1927, Dali puts that into paintings, but with more of a, um, he starts to have that surrealistic point of view, so it's not full cubism. But you see him start playing around. This is Dali really exploring his own talent, where he wants to end up in the spectrum of artists. He still has not graduated art school yet, almost. These were done 25. The one on the left, maybe 26. We're still not sure. He graduates barely. He actually failed. Um, art school in 26 and that was the turning point for Dali where he knew which direction he was going to go. This, this is a beautiful sketch and it's based off of Engre, the artist. So Dali was studying all sorts of artists when he was a child. His father had a complete set of the Gowan art books. 
Um, so there Dali, even as a young boy, would flip through these little books, learning about the old masters and their styles. And then when he was in school, he would start to develop the techniques to be like those masters. So femme couchée, or reclining woman, as we call it in English. Here's the study on the left. Here's the fine finalized painting. So on the left, you see he's playing, well, maybe the woman's holding her foot, but he decides not to do that in the finished painting. It's also uh, transposed, like maybe he even put the paper down on the canvas somehow to do a transfer type of process, which we know he did with some works because they're in the opposite direction. But again, you can see Dali thinking out loud in his drawings before the painting is finalized. This is also highly Picasso influenced. I'm gonna go back a little bit in time but to show you his gouaches. Again, this is like an opaque watercolor, much thicker, almost like um, acrylic. It's strictly water-based. They're very hard to conserve. But again, it's just showing that he can work in any medium. And on the left is a very um, young, he would have been about 17 at the time. This is kind of one of his first self-portraits. Dali was very sick as a child, so oftentimes he would be in bed looking out the window, drawing. So this is his idea of a self-portrait. Again, we have the same type of fingers that we saw in that other drawing, the sketch of the male head with the child. Um, it, it gives sort of a creepy quality to, to his work. Um, just showing what his young minds um, was thinking. Over on the right is a beautiful piece. I love this piece. It's gouache and oil on cardboard. So, and this is Fiesta and Figuera, so they would have these parties, these festivals, and this was an example of um, like a poster. This was used as a poster for one of these festivals. The colors are just brilliant now that it's been conserved. She was able to spot clean everything. As a gouache, you can't completely immerse it in water because it's soluble, but she was able to spot clean and they are just gorgeous. And it being on cardboard means um, it's very fragile. So again, this would be a piece that would have to go back in the vault soon after the exhibit and not seen for a while. Here on the left, Saltenbank. This was um, Picasso did these paintings of these clown, really isn't a perfect translation, but it's kind of close. Um, some curators believe this is sort of a self-portrait of Dali as well. He starts, um, we start to see some of his voyeur tendencies in his early work. Um, this piece is also on cardboard, very tiny, extremely tiny. So he probably just picked up a piece of cardboard, some family friends, one of the friends was a painter and actually offered Dali um, studio space so he could work even as a young child when he went on vacation to these people's home. And then over on the right, 1921, 17 years old, he's illustrating book covers. So he was obviously well known in the area and of course his father was a notary which is almost like an attorney but with more status. So he was very well known so he was already getting commissioned to do illustrations for book covers at this time. Here we are back to the Sardana. So if you remember that very first sketch from around 1916, here about four years later, Dolly takes it a step forward 
and it's oil, watercolor, and ink on paper. Again, this is a famous dance, the Sardana. Um, it being witches, there was a book coming out that he was illustrating as well. In this one town, it was thought that it was wrought with witches. Um, his nanny used to talk to him about this. So these are where some of his ideas came from, and he put them on paper. Now we move into surrealism. So this is what Dali is really known for. So when he graduates, well, fails slash graduates, if people don't know the story, I'll tell it real quick. He told his professor, he was, he was sitting for his final exam, and he told his professor, I'm better than you. you. You can't judge my work because I'm better than you. So, <laughs> yeah, so I think his father had something to do with him actually getting to graduate. Um, but it was 1926, 27, where Dali really says, okay, I've done everything in art school. I've learned about all the great masters. Now I'm going to do my own thing. And he gears towards surrealism. He's in a perfect time period, the perfect opportunity to do this. So he says, my whole ambition in the pictorial domain is to materialize the images of concrete irrationality with the most imperialist fury of precision. Now Dali was all about the concrete irrationality. In basic terms, seeing something in a picture which is not truly obvious, and it's based on individuals' rationality. So you would see something else in a picture that I would see. And so he explores this idea throughout his surrealist period. So th this painting on the right is the weaning of furniture nutrition. It's in our collection, beautiful, beautiful painting. It's, it's the symbol of surrealism. But over here on the left, you see a study. So Dolly didn't just sit down at this canvas or panel and just paint. He practiced. He wanted to see how he was going to use it. This figure is actually based on his nanny, but it's also melded with the women that would mend fishermen's nets on the shoreline. Um, but as you can see, the transfer process, it's in the opposite direction. So we don't know, maybe he used it in some way to transfer to the panel. We're not sure. But you can see, and we have other studies. I didn't include them because they had some erotic imagery that wasn't necessary. But you can see where he's taking, we have a study where he's working on this cabinet and he's really trying to figure out what he wants to do on the final oil painting. It's truly fascinating. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is basically almost exact. And this was used as a frontispiece for a book that came out in 1935. And then a little bit later, he did a final painting of it, but it's almost exact. It has the same key elements. This girl, which is a symbol of purity. He based it on his sister, Anna Maria. Um, yeah, so almost exact. And this is in a private collection. I'm hoping one day it will come out and we can see it in person. And if you notice, here's that cabinet again. And if you come to the Dali Museum, you can take our tour, which we talk about all his symbols. They go into detail about all his, we call it iconography. But it's all his symbols that you will see from the early period all the way to the late period. 
And here is a study for Enigma of William Tell. This drawing on the left is only about five by seven. This painting is 13 feet wide. So he starts off but we can tell this isn't just like a doodling. It's not an initial concept. There's obviously some other drawings that had those initial concepts because by the time he reaches this drawing, he's got almost everything figured out that he wants in the final painting. Why he chose to do such a small drawing and then do a 13 foot wide painting, I don't know. And this is one of our newest acquisitions. This is in a book. It's about five inches high. It's very small. This is one of Dolly's famous, besides the melting watch, this is one of his famous um, figures, the paranoic face. And this was all based on a postcard he saw and the postcard was of an African tribe somewhere in Africa sitting outside their village and when he picked it up and he looked at it and he showed Andre Breton who was the father of surrealism Breton said well that looks like Marquis de Sade now that was someone that the Surrealists very much looked up to, read all his writings. So Breton, that's that concrete irrationality. Breton saw Marquis de Sade in this postcard of these African villagers. So Dali says, you know, you're right. So he does a drawing based on the postcard. And if you flip it vertically, you see, you'll have to go home and look at pictures of Marquis de Sade, but it's like the white wig. You can actually see it. When someone puts that idea in your head, you can definitely see it. Um, but this is a fascinating piece. And then there is the final painting. This was in a book that he dedicated to Paul Eluar, who was Gala's first husband. If those of you don't know, very interesting relationship. Gala was married to Paul, who was also in the Surrealist group. Gala came to visit in Catechez one summer in 1929 with her husband. She never went back to her husband. She stayed with Dali. And Paul and Gala and Dali remained friends till Paul's death. So this was dedicated to Paul by Dali in this book. Here it is blown up, you see it on the right, where it's more of the postcard, and then when you flip it vertically, you can see a face. Most of us can. And trust me, if you go home or on your phone after, look up Marquis de Sade and you'll see his face in there. So then we have the games, the experiments. So all the surrealists did this. And I believe Jay did a workshop on decalcomania. Uh, decalcomania was, was invented by a Spanish Dominguez. Um, but all the surrealists played it. They would just squeeze dots of paint on a piece of paper, fold it, and then see what you get. And then they would, um, they could leave it just as it was, or in some decalcomanias you see where then he goes in and adds so you can truly see what he wants the viewer to see. But this, he obviously had an idea in his head prior to squeezing the dots of paint. This is his iconic symbol of the woman with the rose head, and you see this throughout the 30s. So we own two pieces. We just located a third, and actually in St. Pete, in a private collection. So Dali, even though this was experiments, he was experimenting quite a lot with this figure and with the calcomania. Here are some other games. On the left is 
exquisite corpse. And if you look closely, you can see these lines. The lines are folded. They would fold the paper. One person would draw on one section of the paper. Then they would fold it under, hand it to the next person without them seeing what was on the prior piece of paper. And then it would continue on until a finished product. And then on the right, head of a donkey. And if you view it the other way, it's a, a grasshopper. So this is the decalcomania technique as well. But this is ink, so he just squeezed ink blots and then folded the paper. I think this one, he had no intention prior, and he just wanted to see what it would come out with. And he looked at it and said, that's a donkey face. I still struggle with the donkey face, folks. I, <laughs> I've, do you see it? Yeah. I have looked at this so many times, and I see ears, but I don't know. I'll, in the no, I guess. Yeah. Sometimes when I look at things digitally, even more blown up, or sometimes that's when I can see Dolly's double image. I'll work on this one, folks. I will. Oops. So these are some of my favorites. This is a large charcoal on paper, very nice paper. Um, but it's actually a study. So it wasn't intended for final use. He is playing with the concept. He is wondering, how am I going to achieve this image? I want three faces to appear out of something that doesn't look like faces. So on the left, we see it because we see figures are then becoming the mouths and nose. So you see it in the drawing. And this is the final painting on the right. So you see Dali worked through it. He liked it. But then he decided to change a lot of the aspects about it. He just wasn't fully convinced that the one on the left was where he wanted to be finally with the painting. Again, this is in our collection. That's why this is a great opportunity to go see in the exhibit gallery, the one on the left, and then you can go next door and see the painting. And sometimes when you see them in person, it's much clearer. But here are some other studies. These are that doodling, that um, <coughs> pre-conceptual, he's just playing around, literally playing around with charcoal, with pencil, he's trying to see, OK, I want a building, but here's where the faces are going to be. And here's a detail of two. So you s and then this is on stationary. So he's just picking up. Ideas came to Dolly all the time. That's a reason why a lot of people couldn't work with him, because he had so many ideas, he just couldn't stop, couldn't stop. Um, so he would just pick up whatever he had and start doodling. But you saw on the large charcoal where it's a much more finished study. Now we move on to ballet. I don't know if you all knew that he was very influential in the ballet field in the 30s. He designed um, stage designs, costumes, Again, he was rather difficult to work with. And some of the designs, the stage designers would be like, we don't even know how we're going to produce that to a scale on the stage. But they did, mostly. Um, this is from the ballet Bacchanal. So these are some costume and stage design ideas. And you can look online. And it's funny because the finished Bacchanal that then showed in New York and went all over in 1939, they managed to create a costume that looked like this. And it shocked audiences. It shocked them, but the ballet traveled for years. It just kept showing and showing. 
This is one of our newest acquisitions. It's a study, again, for the same ballet for Bacchanal. Uh, this is a collage piece. So this is a picture of King Ludwig, Ludwig II. And then here's Dolly's rendition of him. Ludwig was considered mad, crazy. So Dolly starts to develop that idea. This is such a beautiful piece. I know it's a bit shocking, but when you see it in person and you see the fine details of a picture that's about eight by 12, it's incredible, just the fine detail in this piece. And again, um, they did create a costume with fin tails like this with the crutches for the final ballet. Here's some details. This figure of a woman, well, it, a woman or a man, androgyny, Dali drew a lot of androgynous figures. This figure you see in a lot of his 30s work. She's recurring and recurring. And now we move into surrealist Hollywood. I don't know if you knew that Dali was actually very good friends with the Marx Brothers. He considered Harpo Marx to be even more surrealist than himself. He loved Harpo. In fact, as a gift, he sent Harpo a harp with barbed wire string. Harpo thought it was hilarious. Unfortunately, we don't own that photo, but there is a picture of Harpo with tape around his fingers playing this barbed wire harp. Um, but Dolly loved them so much that he wrote a script that he wanted them to create this film. And with the script, there were lots of studies of the scenery. This is a beautiful charcoal drawing. Dinner in the desert lit by bur burning giraffes. Burning giraffes become a very famous symbol of Dali. But this, ooh, excuse me. Ooh. This becomes a scene in this film. Unfortunately, it was never realized. Um, we do own a typescript manuscript of the film. And it is, I think it was a little too bizarre even for the Marx Brothers. I think that's probably why they, they didn't go through with it. But here are two other studies for the same film. So you see the Marx Brothers here. Um, I love this one. And then the bicyclists. And then you have Death Cycling Tour where the cyclists are going off a cliff. These were all scenes from the film. So then we move on to America. Uh, Dali moved to America, the onset of World War II. He escaped through Portugal. Like many other artists at the time, he was able to get a visa. I actually tracked all of um, the boat manifests and saw his movements, fascinating study. But he came here from 1940 to 1948. And he says, begin by drawing and painting like the old masters. After that, do as you see fit. You will always be respected. So by this time, it's 1940. He had officially been kicked out of the Surrealist group in 1939. His political ideas were not in alignment with Breton. Breton was a communist. Dali was not. So they kicked him out. So by 1940, he starts to move away from surrealism. And he, later on, he defines himself as a classical artist. He goes back to his original training of training like the old masters, but with a dolly twist. So here he begins these transformations. This is a 19th century print by Montague Dawson, not 19th century, 1937, so excuse me. 
So he has an actual print. He bought it. He probably found it at some flea market. And he transforms it. And I've gone over and over. I like to see exactly what he took away, what he added. Um, but they're side by side in the gallery. It's really fun. These are fun projects for him. He's just playing around to see what he can do. Here's another one. Here's the 19th century print, Lost on the Mountain. So you see these group of sheep. Dali turns it into this surreal type library. But you can, he did it right on the print. So he would use the gouache and paint right onto the print. So the sheep turn into furniture of the library. The bookcases are in front of the mountains that were in the original print. It's a really fun piece. Here's a close-up of the lamp with the lips and the eye. And here's another transformation. This one is so small to see the difference. But did you see the difference? If you go here, and then he adds, he adds the lips, you see a face. So this one was so slight that all he had to do was just use a couple of sections of gouache and transform this magazine cover into a face. Do it again. I've done this for hours, folks. I, I love it. See when the lips appear? So he adds, those lips are all gouache. He completely adds that in. So, and that's right on, we've, um, we've printed the, the gouache, or printed, um, framed the actual magazine, because he did it right on the magazine. And here's where you see Dolly really exploring um, a very large painting in our collection, Nature Mort. He's taking sections of it and he's doing drawings. This is about the time Dolly is fascinated with math and math concepts. So he is using math and physics theory to create his paintings. So here, and you'll see in the final painting, the pair, this figure, so they've just learned that molecules, they're constantly mo moving. Things aren't static. So the final painting is called Still Life Fast Moving. So Dali is incorporating these theories from physics into his work. He's fascinated by math and science and uses the theories. So this was actually the start of this. He's playing, like, how can he take this bowl and make it look like it's spinning, it's fast moving, nothing static. Um, I wasn't around this time, but I'm sure it blew everyone's mind at the time when these physicists came up, they discovered this, that things are in constant motion. And here, this, this part is brutal for me. I'm not a math person. But um, Matila Gika was a Hungarian mathematician. Dolly read like every book, had it in his library. And he actually uses this mathematical formula. And he creates what's called a mise en page. Well, Dolly had someone create the mise en page, which means put in place. It's the basis of how he was going to create this painting. 
The painting may look disorderly on first glance, but when you place the mathematical concept on top of it, you can see where he was using it for placement of the objects. We have both in our collection. So this is going by the Heisenberg principle. So this launches him into further study of discontinuous matter, and Dali calls it in his art term, nuclear mysticism. So you start to see everything blown apart, but yet still together in all his artwork. Here is a study for a very small part in this great big masterwork. So he's done several studies, taking each little figure and working it out before putting it on the final canvas. Pope's ear on the left is in our collection. The painting on the right is at the Met. So again, he's working with concepts, trying to figure out what he wants to place on the final canvas. My favorite piece, he comes back to his melting watch, but now everything's shattered, all the pieces. It's his nuclear mysticism. And there's the final oil piece. Frankly, I think the drawing is much better because it's more detailed. You see more of the fragmented segments of the watch. It's beautiful. It's about five inches wide. So to create this type of detail on something that's five inches wide is truly incredible. Here he is, a picture of himself. He's another study of this work. Here's some more of his nuclear mysticism. This is combat. This, when you see it in person, again, it's truly unbelievable when you see the detail done in ink, watercolor, but to be able to do such detail with just ink is amazing. And he says, drawing is the honesty of the art. There is no possibility of cheating. It is either good or bad. Some of his spontaneous experiments, this he would just drip blots of paints, but unlike the abstract expressionist that would just leave the drips, he would create faces. And this is actually a study for a very large um, piece, Battle of Tetuan, but you start to see um, faces of the battle, horses. So this is the final piece. And over here on the right are the sections that our early gouaches are representing. Here you see he's drawn a head in these drops of paint. It's very thick. It's not a smooth surface. It's impasto. He's just kind of smashed the paint on and then created the figures around it. Here's a close-up. These are beautiful pieces. Seven flies in a model. There's two actual flies, real flies. The rest are watercolor. It took a long time for the conservator to figure out which was which because his drawing was so good. And honestly, I think the one on the bottom is his drawing, and the one on the top is the actual fly carcass. Here's more of that experimental where he would just smear ink or drop the ink and create figures out of them. And then one of the most famous pieces, Trace Picos, this was actually for a ballet as well. But he took an old print on the right, a botanical print, and then created the figure in the middle. And later on in the 70s, he continued to do this. And we have like three suites of um, botanical prints where he actually transformed the old botanical 
print and made figures or uh, symbols on them. So you're going to begin to paint long before you know at all how to draw. Then his religious studies. This study is actually basically finished work. It was exhibited as a finished work, but it's a study for several paintings. So here in Scotland, this is what it's basically the study of. But it ends up in two of our masterworks too. Here's the Christ on the cross, again based on this study. And then also in Gala Contemplating, the Christ on the cross, all based on the study. His two disciples, it's a very large piece, and it was a study for a very small portion on one of his large masterworks in the National Gallery by the bathrooms in the basement. <laughs> it's when it was given to the National Gallery, the owner said it could never leave the National Gallery. The National Gallery does not like this piece very much, so it has to leave it up, but it puts it in a very inconspicuous place. But this is for a study or for these two disciples. These two are studies for also a large masterwork two components of it. Study of Gala's face. Again, you see kind of the transfer aspect, her head's going in the opposite direction. And then this figure, the supersonic figure, he calls it, is right down here. It takes up a small portion of the large painting. So he would do that with a lot of his large masterworks. He would break them apart and do these studies. And here he is working on it. He did two um, paintings entitled the same, um, Madonna of Port Legat. And then here's some more studies of Galaxy Dalacy. Here you see the DNA molecules that turned into soldiers with guns, with rifles. And here it is on the finished work. This is just on a notepad. It's still got the spiral on the side. Here's a close up. And again, what he always told people, begin by drawing and painting like the old masters. After that, you do as you see fit. You will always be respected. Here's studies of our large Toreador. The Venus, which he originally saw a box of Venus pencils and said, I want to incorporate it, that into my artwork. And here you are. This right here is this figure here. So he's still, he's not uncertain which way he wants the figure to go. So he's just drawing all sorts of possibilities. He's drawing angles and perspectives to then be able to put on the final work. And here's the Venus side by side by the three large Venus figures in the painting. And then the final quote, the true painter must be able before an empty desert to fill his canvas with extraordinary scenes. And I think he does that in amazing ways, but he doesn't just sit down at a blank canvas and two hours later has a final product. There's an order to his work, just like with every artist. The many studies that you saw today, and hopefully that you will come to the museum and see them in person, they're incredible. And then to be able to go across the hall and see some of those final works and see how 
his ideas transferred over to the finished product. And that's all I have for you. I hope I didn't go too over.